presence because I'm going to be talking about that as we continue on in this series entitled Noel as we are we are headed full course for Christmas y'all it's this week and I want to thank my brother Mike DeBacco for every week sharing the Christmas countdown on Facebook so I know exactly how many days I have left before I have to crunch shop. <laughs> but you know, I'm, I'm so thankful for this time of remembering Jesus coming to this earth. And yes, we are in the week of Christmas. And yes, it's just in a few days. Today's the 19th. And in six more days, we'll be celebrating. Families will gather around Christmas trees. Families will gather around tables that are decorated with Christmas displays and food and all of those things. And one of the things that my family used to always do before, either before we ate or before we opened presents, we would get the Bible. And this has been a tradition in my family as I was growing up. And even with my kids, I did this. Before we opened a present, before we ate a bite, we'd open the Bible and we'd read the story from Luke chapter 2 of the birth of Jesus Christ. And then we would take time to just thank him and to praise him for coming to this earth. And so I want, I want to encourage you as we go into this week, make that a priority. I know you're going to be busy. I know this week is going to be hectic and maybe you have birth, Christmas party and Christmas party and Christmas party and you have a lot of things going on and you, anybody here not done with your Christmas shopping? Everybody else is finished? Isn't Amazon a great thing? <laughs> Hallelujah. You can, you can do all of your Christmas shopping without even leaving your house and it's delivered in two days <laughs> or less. Y'all, it, it's almost kind of scary sometimes because it's like Amazon knows what I'm thinking and they pre-order it for me before I ever even go on to order it. It's already in my cart. It's weird. And seriously, one, I, I'll, I'll tell you how, how freaked out I got about it. I was, uh, one Saturday afternoon, it was about 2 o'clock in the afternoon, I went on Amazon and I ordered something. And before church service was over on Sunday, somebody had come in to deliver it here at church. And I'm thinking, it's been less than 24 hours. And how do you do that? And I'm thinking, maybe there really is a Santa. <laughs> Hallelujah. I want to go into part three today of this Noel sermon series. As we began this, I spoke to you about what Noel means. It's, it means natal or nativity or birth. And so when we sing about the first Noel, we're singing about the first birth, meaning the birth of Christ and how Christ came into this world and was born of Mary and was laid in a manger. I talked about the O, the N, the N stood for na na nativity or natal. The O stood for overwhelming love. What caused him to come? What compelled him to come? And it was you and I. It was us. He came for us. And I'm so thankful that he loved me beyond every single imperfection and every single failure and every single time that, that I was disobedient to him and every single time that I was running away from him and rebelling against him, he still loved me and he still came for me. And I'm so grateful for that. Thank God that he never gives up on us, that his overwhelming love pursues us. And it captures us. And today I want to speak to you about the E in Noel. Emmanuel. God with us. And Isaiah chapter 7, verse 13 to 14. If you will find that passage of scripture and put your finger there. Isaiah chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. And also Matthew chapter 1, starting in verse 18. I'm going to be reading from both of these passages of Scripture because I believe you can really never get enough of the Word of God. Amen? Amen. Isaiah chapter 7, verses 13 and 14 says this. Then he said, Hear now, O house of David, 
Is it a small thing for you to weary men, but will you weary God also? Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Emmanuel. Now hold that thought and look with me in Matthew chapter 1, verse 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. But while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. So all this will be done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet saying, behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son. And they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. And I want to stop right there. God with us. The scripture passage focuses on, On the visit of the angel Gabriel at different times to the home of Mary and also to Joseph, to their homes in Nazareth, to deliver a message to them that she would conceive and bear the Son of God. And Joseph and Mary had a lot of difficulty comprehending initially the miracle of the virgin birth. I mean, I still wrestle with that. The virgin birth, how can that possibly be? But with God, every single itty bitty thing is possible. Every single enormous thing is possible with God. Not not only that she would conceive of the Holy Spirit and that she was a virgin, but that she would bear the Savior of the world. Can you imagine what kind of brain explosions must have been going on with Mary and Joseph at this moment? And you know, I have found at times in my life that God has spoken things to me or spoken promises over me or given me prophetic words that blew my mind. And I thought, God, it's impossible. That can't happen. And yet I've watched as God has made it happen. There have been times in my life where I didn't know what to do or where to go or what the right direction was. And God showed up and said, this is what my plan and my purpose is. And I said, God, that can't happen. That's impossible. I don't see how you can make that happen. And God said, watch me. Just be still and watch me. Watch what I'm about to do in your heart and in your life and in your midst. And maybe, maybe, just maybe, you're going through something right now in your own heart and in your mind that has been a struggle and you're having difficulty understanding it and the comprehension just isn't there. Hold on because the promise of God is true. Don't give up on what God has spoken into your life because if God speaks it, he will perform it. He will make it happen. In this passage, the announcement of the birth of Jesus is anticipated by the prophet Isaiah as he spoke. And and just as God would be in, in Mary, in the person of the Son, so he would be with his people as a man. He would walk among them. He would perform miracles. He would teach them. He would instruct them. He would heal their sick. He would raise their dead. He would walk on their waters. Because he's not just the Lord, our creator. He is the Lord over all creation. And so he can do what he wants. Even though he was in a physical, humanly body, he was still fully God. At the same time that he was fully man, something else I can't completely comprehend. But one day when I look in his eyes, I'm going to know. And it's just going to all make sense. 
And so as fully God, he still had the capacity to perform miracles and walk on water. He still had the capacity to speak the word and the storm cease. Listen, somebody needs to hear this because he's about to stand in your life and say, peace. You've been going through a storm. You've been going through a struggle. You've been going through a difficult time. You've been uncertain and unsure. But right now, he's about to come onto the upper deck of the boat of your life. And he's going to look at the storm. And he's going to say, peace, be still. He's going to speak to it. And in that moment, it's going to be done. Because when he speaks his word, there's nothing that can stop the plan of God and the purpose of God. The scripture says, That he is God with us. Nazareth. Think with me for just a moment about a city called Nazareth. It was a tiny village in Galilee. It was so unimportant that it wasn't even mentioned in the Old Testament. It only rose to prominence after it was identified as the hometown of Mary and Joseph and the place where Jesus would spend some of his formative years here on this earth. Located in Lower Galilee, it was halfway between the Sea of Galilee and the Mediterranean Sea. And the city of Nazareth had only one fresh fountain, one fresh spring where they could get water for everyone in the city. So I imagine there were many times that Jesus would go to this spring, to this well, to gather water for the family. And this spring today is called Mary's Well. It still exists. And I can imagine that Nazareth being a small town of unimportance. It was, it was the town that when, when it was told that he was Jesus of Nazareth and, and the, the statement came out, can anything good come from Nazareth? I mean, it had a reputation of being a dirty, filthy, poor, destitute place. Can anything good come out of Nazareth. And I want to just pause on this for a moment because there have been times in my life and possibly times in your life where I've been in the midst of a battle and I thought, God, there, this is horrible and there's nothing good that can ever come out of this. And leave it up to God to choose Nazareth, a place that people thought was non-existent and irrelevant to raise up the Son of God. And he does the same in our lives. Those areas of our lives that we think are unimportant, those areas of our lives that seem poor, destitute, maybe even dead, it's in those places that God raises things up in us. And God does things in our lives. And I can imagine the poverty that characterized the population of Nazareth, the city of Nazareth, in, in the small synagogue possibly that they had there, the Jewish inhabitants of Nazareth probably studied the Torah and cherished the promises of the coming Messiah. Perhaps Mary even herself at some point had read the prophetic statement of Isaiah that said, and the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and you will call his name Emmanuel. But she probably thought, that's going to be for the governor's daughter. Somebody who is of importance. Somebody who, who lives in a palace. Somebody who's wealthy or has influence. And yet, God chose the meek, mild, unknown things, the unknown person, to perform the greatest miracle that probably has ever been. Listen, Jesus did some great miracles. He raised people from the dead. It, impossible. It seemed impossible. But think about this for a moment. A virgin shall conceive. And here's Mary. Possibly thinking. It's going to be someone else. But it doesn't matter who it is. We just want Messiah to come. Because at this time. They're under the heel of the Roman government. And they're looking for a deliverer. They're looking for a Messiah. They're looking for somebody to come in and bring victory and bring relief to them. And Isaiah says his name will be called Emmanuel, which means God with us. And so perhaps, O come, O come, Emmanuel, surely was a cry that rose up constantly in the city streets of Nazareth as they waited for the Messiah, as they waited for the deliverer, as they prayed for the promise to be revealed. You see, here's, here's what I understand is, 
as the people of God begin to cry out for deliverance, for repentance, for revival, as it gets in the heart of the people and they get to a place where they understand if God doesn't answer, we are hopeless. Maybe that's where they were in the city of Nazareth. Maybe that's where they, where they were in Jerusalem, in Israel. They were at a place where they were under Roman government and they were crying out for a deliverer just like the nation of Israel cried out for a deliverer when they were under Egyptian bondage. And they cried out that God would raise somebody up or God raised somebody up. And constantly throughout the course of history, God did that for the nation. But look at them right here, right now. Politically, governmentally, economically, everything was dark for them because of Roman oppression. And so they cried out for the deliverer. They cried out, wondering, when is he going to come? When is he going to show up? Church, I believe that in this day and age, things are dark in our world. Things are evil in our world. Things are oppressive in our world. But what a great time for the church to rise up and begin to cry out to God. Lord, send that latter rain revival. Send that latter outpouring on this generation where revival begins to spring up and you deliver this nation and this world from the oppression of the evil one. Because right now, there is an oppression going on in our whole world. And um, I'm not saying it's in the White House. I'm not saying it's in other governmental buildings. That's not the issue. The government is not our enemy, y'all. Satan is our enemy. And God has given him a little bit of power for a season on this earth. On this earth. Oh, but listen, there's a coming a time. There's coming a time when the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords is going to return and we shall behold him. Emmanuel, God with us. I want to take that statement of God with us and I want to kind of break it down and put the emphasis on each word in different parts of what I'm going to talk to you about here. So let's break it down. God. Do I need to say more? In Genesis chapter 1, the word of God says, in the beginning was God. There was nothing else. There was God. He is from eternity past. He is eternity present. And he always will be. This God that we serve, he has no birthday and he has no death day. And although I know we celebrate December 25th as the day Jesus came to this earth, let me tell you something in eternity. He just always was and he always will be. Again, one of those things I can't comprehend because I think in a very linear, finite fashion. And everything has to have a beginning and everything has to have an end. But not so with this God that we serve. God is above all. He created it all. And in Genesis chapter 1 verses 26 and 27, the word of God says this. Then God said, let us make man in our own image. That's an important statement. God didn't say, let me make man in my own image. He wasn't talking to himself, but he was talking to himself. Make sense? He looked at the Son, and God the Father looked at the Holy Spirit, and He said, Let us make man in our own image and in our own likeness. And so He, God, created man in His own image. In the image of God, created He them. Male and female created He them them. Why did God make man? He did not do so on a whim, suddenly becoming bored with the angelic beings that he created. The angels, the seraphims, the cherubims, they are beings that are under God's total control. They exist to carry out and to fulfill his wishes. They do his bidding. They are his messengers. But he desired a creature 
with whom he could have a different kind of relationship. God took great pains in preparing for his new creation. He chose the earth. When darkness was upon it and it was just another planet, he chose the earth to be his staging area. He brought light. He brought order. Out of darkness and chaos, he brought all of these things into existence. He created a garden of absolute, indescribable beauty, perfection. And he made Adam complete by fashioning Eve from Adam's rib. And so by doing so, he created them, male and female, in the image of God. You see the masculine sense and the feminine sense together. We are all in the image of God. And let me just pause here and say, I believe that God created two genders, male and female. And they are in the image of the eternal God. The real mystery, though, of the creation of Adam and Eve is that he made them with a moral freedom to choose, which no other creature seemed to have. The birds, the, the bees, the bears, the, all of them. I couldn't think of another bee animal. <laughs> you chuckling at me. <laughs> the freedom of the will would make it possible for them to know and communicate with God at a deeper level than the rest of creation. The greatest mystery of all is that God allowed human beings to choose to either love him and obey him or to reject him and go their own way. God could have created us as cookie cutter and we all had no choice but to serve him. But he didn't. And when God created humanity, he became, God became the God of, of many names. In the beginning, he was Elohim, the majestic God of creation. The God that created everything. When he came seeking sinful people, he became Yahweh. The God who longs to establish a covenant relationship. And when Adam and Eve sinned, God refused to give up on mankind. God refused to let go of the relationship. Even though, even though at that time they were taken out of the garden, God would not give up. And here, in the person of Jesus Christ, he became Emmanuel. God with us. In order to expand our understanding of Emmanuel, we, we have to shift our focus to the second word, the, that little preposition with. A preposition connects a noun or a pronoun with another part of the sentence or phrase. And the dictionary states that the word with means alongside of or near to, in the company of, into, among, as an associate or companion, in support of, or on the side of. So when we look at this, that, that word with is God alongside of his people. God in support of his people. God who is the one who is among his people. One of the many names of the Holy Spirit is paraclete. You may have never heard that word before, but it's the word paraclete, which means one who is called alongside another. Jesus told his disciples that when he went away, he would send another comforter, another paraclete who would walk with them and be alongside of them. Listen, God is near to his people. He is, he is so near that he knows what we think. He knows what we say before it ever escapes our lips. 
He knows what we're struggling with, even though we may never say it. He knows how we feel in our body right now, whether we're tired or weak or sick. He knows he is indeed God with us, and he completely stands beside us. There have been moments in my life where I've been going through some things, and I've prayed you know, there are times that you pray and you, you immediately feel the presence of the Lord with you. You immediately sense him as he surrounds you. There's nothing like that. But there have been times that I've prayed and I haven't been able to feel that. And I wonder, God, where are you when I'm hurting, when I'm broken, when I'm struggling? God, where, where are you? And the reality is, he's right there. Whether I feel him or not, it doesn't change the fact that he's right there because he is with us. Listen, all you have to do is say his name. Say Jesus. Say Jesus. And he's right there. I'm reminded of the story of a man named Cleopas and a friend of his who, after the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, they didn't know at the time that Jesus had been raised from the dead. And the scripture said they were on their way on the road to a town called Emmaus. And they were talking amongst themselves, and all of a sudden, Jesus was right there alongside of them. And they began to talk with him. And as they began to talk with him, Jesus began to expound on some things. It wasn't just idle chit-chat. It wasn't how you doing or how's it going. It wasn't how many friends do you have on social media or how many followers. The scripture said that they were so grieved in their spirit that they said to Jesus, they didn't recognize who he was. And they said to him, are you a stranger here? Do you not know what's happened? And they began to tell him and Jesus began to expound on the word of God to them as he walked with them. He shared with them from the very beginning every prophetic statement about himself that was now fulfilled. Read it. It's in the word of God. It says he began and he, he un, unloaded it all on them of how every scripture, every prophetic statement was fulfilled in Jesus. And they went back to their house and they sat down and they ate with him. And the word of God says that all of a sudden he just wasn't there. And they said to themselves, didn't our hearts burn within us? All of a sudden they knew he has to be alive because didn't our hearts burn within us? He's not here anymore. But the words that he spoke went straight to our heart and set our hearts on fire. Because he came alongside of them. He's God with us. You may feel like you're walking through a time in your life when you, all you know is there was a crucifixion and a death and you don't know anything about the resurrection yet, but I want to tell you something. In the midst of that walk down that lonely road, Jesus is going to come alongside of you and he's going to say, I'm not finished yet. I want to show you what I've done and who I am and where I'm taking you. I want to show you how I'm going to provide for you. I want to show you how I'm going to heal you. I want to show you how I'm going to strengthen you in the midst of the times when you feel your weakest. God is near his people. He is indeed Emmanuel. God is in our company. God with us. See, we can imagine God being with his angelic and celestial creation. creation. We can even understand that God would relish being in the midst of himself, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We can even imagine how much he would enjoy being in his flawless 
creation and nature. But with us, we inherited Adam and Eve's sinful nature, their inflated and distorted ego that bought into the lie that you can be like God. We are heirs to their determination to have it their own way and to figure it out on their own, become like God. Why would God want to be with us? Hmm. You know, David kind of wrestled with this same thought in Psalm chapter 8, verses 3 and 4, when he said, Lord, when I consider your heavens and the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him? Or the son of man that you would care for him? Human logic cannot understand why God would care. We're weak, we're frail, we're imperfect, we're rebellious, we're spoiled sometimes. And yet God still loves us so much that he wants to be with us. We all have people in our lives that we enjoy being with. And we want to be with them. And when we're not with them, all we can think about is being with them. <laughs> kind of like me right now with this grandbaby. I told my daughter, my son-in-law, my wife, and my son-in-law's parents... I'm sorry, but I'm taking her back to Titusville with me this weekend, and y'all won't get to hold her. But you see, I didn't win. But I'm anxious to be with her again, because I could stare into that little face for hours. And how much more does our Heavenly Father love us? How much more? He loves us so much that he looks beyond all of our faults and all of our failures and he sees our need. What is our need? Redemption. Redemption. You may say, well, pastor, I need a healing. It comes through redemption. You may say, pastor, I need direction. It comes through redemption. You see, we have to deal with the first things first. We have to deal with our heart. When Jesus would heal people, he would forgive their sins first. And then he'd say, take up your bed and walk. Why would God care? I believe it's because we are a direct reflection of him. We are made in his image. We are created in his image. And he loves us. We don't know why God continued to love and seek out this sinful human race to fellowship with him. We don't know why God continues to love us, still sinful and disobedient as we are. But we are his children. And he has promised to remain with us to the very end. No matter what we're walking through, no matter what we're dealing with, he has promised, y'all, he's promised that he would never leave us or forsake us. He is God with us. He's on your side. That means there's no attack of the enemy that surprises God. God already knew, and he's standing there with you empowering you to fight and anointing you to speak his word strengthening you to suit up in his armor what a glorious truth we have in this fact that he is Emmanuel God with us and this week we're celebrating his coming to earth as a baby they named him Jesus because he would save the world from their sins. 
He is known as Emmanuel because he came and he put on human flesh to be amongst us and to be with us. Today, I want you to understand this. If you haven't heard anything else that I've said, he is right there with you today. He is right there with your loved ones who are struggling. He is right there walking beside you in the things that you're dealing with, in the path that you've chosen. He is directing you, he is leading you, and he is guiding you. Today, no matter what you have need of, he is here in this place to meet your need. He is here to speak into your life. I want to ask you to stand with me. Maybe you're at a place where you think God has forgotten about you or God is unaware of that through which you are going. Maybe you're at a place where things in your life have blindsided you or shocked you or tried to make you afraid. Maybe you're at a place in your life where you say, Pastor, I just have a need and God knows what it is. And today I need to feel his presence as he walks with me. I just feel led because I know, I know there are needs in this house. God is able to meet those needs. Some of you have family members that need salvation and you've been praying and you've been seeking God. He's here today to meet that need. Some of you have been dealing with sickness or loss in your life. And you've been struggling, but I'm telling you, He's here today to meet that need. And no matter what your need is, He is powerful enough to do what seems impossible in your life. If you're here and you say, Pastor, I have a need in my life that I just, I want prayer for this morning and I need the Lord to stand beside me on this. I want to pray over you. Would you step out from where you are? And would you come to this altar? You can find a place to kneel or you can stand. But I want you to come because I want to pray over you this morning. Pastor, I have a need. I have a struggle. I have an issue. And today, I just want that reassurance that he is there with me. Would you come? Would you come? Because he's right here today. He's right here to meet every need. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Holy Spirit. say, Pastor, I, I don't really have a need. I want you to come. Stand behind somebody that's up here. Put your hand on their shoulder. Pray with them. Sometimes we need to know that there are other believers standing behind us, praying over us. Each and every need is in God's hand and God's control. Today, He is here, church. He is here. Thank you, Lord.
Emmanuel, God with us. And this week as we celebrate His coming to earth, remember that He is with you. He is with you. Praying God's blessing over you today. May you go in the